Hello there, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is John Muir Laws, and this is your uh, Nature Journal Workshop. Uh, today, we have a special guest, actually a team of special guests from Point Blue Conservation Science, one of uh, the world's leading conservation research um, uh, organizations, biodiversity research organizations, um, whose work advises us about how to best manage the biodiversity of this planet. Um, with us today, I'm going to introduce um, Anne Chadwick, who is the chair of the board of Point Blue Conservation Science, um, who will also introduce her team. We are delighted and honored to be uh, among all of you today. And Anne Chadwick, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Jack, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Point Blue, for those who don't know, is a, a community of over 160 of scientists and a lot of supporters who are nature nerds, like myself. And we're doing everything from climate smart restoration to using long-term ecological data sets to, to solve problems worldwide and advancing the application of science-based, evidence-based uh, work on protecting nature for benefits for wildlife and people. And we train the next generation of climate smart conservation leaders. And two of those are with us today. We have Lishka Arada, who's been with us for many years and she will be behind the scenes answering your questions, providing some resources. And then we have Chris Newman and she is the principal ecologist in the Pacific Coast and Central Valley group at Point Blue. And she leads our work. She's been leading our work on snowy plovers uh, since 1996. I won't go into too much detail on her background, but we are thrilled to have her here today. And I think I will, without further ado, turn it over to Chris for a presentation on snowy plovers. Thanks so much, Anne and Jack and Ivea, and especially Thanks to everybody who took the time out of their, I'm sure, very busy day to join today. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Our topic today is sandy beaches, dunes, and snowy plovers of the Pacific Coast. Um, I'm going to talk about all of those things, and I'll I'll show you guys a little bit of an outline of what how that's going to go. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about Point Blue. Um, this is our mission, which you can see here. Um, as Anne mentioned in her introduction, our work has really been based in understanding long-term trends and ecosystems. Um, we have over 160 scientists now monitoring ecosystems, everything from wetlands, beaches, to working on regenerative ranching on private ranches, um, all the way down to Antarctica, working on Adelie penguins. So we're a very diverse group and we're determined and devoted to use our long-term data to inform protection of these ecosystems and also um, to plan and prepare for the effects of climate change so that we can maintain this wonderful biodiversity that we all appreciate. So here's my outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I thought it would be really fun from a nature journaling standpoint to spend a little bit of time on the environmental setting of beaches and dunes, which is where the snowy plover lives. And it's just a really fascinating ecosystem. And then I'm going to spend probably the bulk of my time talking about snowy plover, natural history and ecology, because that's really where all the fun stuff is. Um, they're such a unique species. And so we'll spend some time on that. And then at the end, I'll give you guys a little bit of a uh, little little view into what we do in terms of monitoring snowy plovers um, and what are some of the things we've learned from our research. But first, I did want to start a little bit with my origin story, um, as Anne kind of alluded to. Um, so I am a native Californian who grew up in Southern California. Um, I got involved in studying birds because of a plant. I got involved in studying birds because of a plant. I had never seen what a real native beach looked like until I came to UC Santa Cruz in 1989 to um, go to school there. I was familiar with highly, heavily impacted human used beaches that were covered in non-native vegetation. And because of this incredibly beautiful, delicate plant that you can see growing out of the sand, um, I was just absolutely intrigued and it inspired me to learn more about all of the other, you know, microcosmic things that are going on in beaches and dunes that are, are 
a key to what the native environment looks like, but are really hard to observe unless you sort of sit yourself down and quietly observe. So this beautiful plant, the beach morning glory, is what inspired me to become a beach ecologist. I want to talk just a little bit about dunes. Um, so if you've never seen a native dune, this is what the vegetation in a native dune looks like. Um, it's a little bit more vegetated than the beach shot that we just looked at. There's probably five or six species of native plant here. You can see how beautifully diverse this is. There's some buckwheat off to the right, the, the beautiful yellow plant in the foreground is something called bluff lettuce or dudleya, which is sort of a, it's in the stone crop family. In the middle there is some silver beech lupin, not flowering, but you can see this was taken, this shot was taken in spring. So this is an incredibly diverse um, habitat, which all this diversity, you know, is reflected across the spectrum from the flora to the invertebrates to the vertebrate species. And here's another example. This is one of our more urban beaches in the Monterey Bay region where we do a lot of our work. Um, this is yellow sand verbena, which is a sand trapping plant and a spectacular view, uh, a spectacular bloom in early spring. And if you're a good observer, you can see off to the left there on the slide, there's actually some stoplights. So this is a very urban beach and, and yet it's a very native beach. Um, so it, just because a beach is urban doesn't mean that it can't be full of beautiful blooming native plants and all the diversity that's associated with those. And just to contrast, um, this is a pre-restoration photo taken down in Morro Bay, which shows a, a very much of a non-native dune. Um, probably everybody that's been on or near the coast has seen ice plant, um, which is an exotic species um, that was uh, actually originally introduced erroneously, but has been really used in a widespread way to stabilize dunes. There's some native shrubs mixed in there too in the, in the middle, but um, you lose a lot of diversity when you end up with these um, sort of non-native uh, mono, sort of monocrops. Um, you lose insect diversity, you lose everything up the kind of the trophic chain in terms of diversity. And again, because this is, you guys are a nature journaling crowd, I thought this cross section is really cool. And this sort of helps us bridge the marine system to the terrestrial system, which is what we're talking about. When we talk about beaches and dunes, we're talking about the coastal strand, which is a key ecotone in the world of ecosystems. And it's a place where um, inputs from the marine environment come on shore. So we talk about beaches as a donor ecosystem or, or as a recipient ecosystem with the marine system as the donor system where we get these trophic subsidies that come on the beaches. And I'll, I'll talk more about what those are in case that sounds like a strange, a strange word. And this, these energetic inputs of nutrients propagate all the way up to the top of the food chain, even up to the predatory birds that are you know, perusing the, <laughs> the coastal strand for their prey. And so to talk a little bit more about, well, what are these trophic subsidies? So this is um, giant kelp, and this is obviously an underwater shot. If you've been on Pacific coasts, you're probably familiar, or the Southern Pacific coast, you're probably familiar with this plant. Um, it's a macro algae. Um, and when this algae is deposited on the beach, we call it, it rack. So you maybe heard the term beach rack um, or algae rack or kelp rack is something that people, a term people use a lot. And so what happens when this gets deposited on beaches, it, it pulls up from its marine home, um, it comes onto the beach, this is that subsidy that comes from the marine environment to the coastal environment, and you can see this um, giant kelp uh, mixed in with a couple other species there. Um, and then this forms the basis for the beach food chain for the birds that we're interested in. And so you can see these little invertebrates, which are amphipods, and these little guys, are these are tiny, and that is a, a single frond of giant kelp there on the zoom in, and they are consumers or grazers of this kelp that's been cast on shore. This is an absolutely central key part of how this ecosystem functions. And amphipods, which we just looked at in other invertebrate fauna, are form the prey base for predatory shorebirds, especially plover species. And then here, this ruddy turnstone, which I'll just kind of let you guys look at this because this is a really spectacular bird um, that spends time on our Pacific coastal beaches. Um, and so here's what it's eating as well. So the same thing, these amphipods on this frond of giant kelp. And so here's another example. This is another really common Pacific kelp, bull kelp, or we call it nereocystis. That's another form of um, macroalgal rack. Um, and when that is deposited on the beaches, it's consumed by these amphipods in the same way. Um, but not only um, does this particular rack form 
um, uh, the basis of the food chain. It also provides nest sites for snowy plovers. So there's a dried frond of this bull kelp um, with a hatching snowy plover nest. So if this is the first time you're seeing a snowy plover nest, that's about maybe four inches across. And those chicks are about the size of cotton balls. And that's a third egg there in the middle between those two chicks that hasn't hatched yet. So not only are there nutrients propagating from the marine environment to the terrestrial environment, but there's some habitat structure being provided as well. And so I just want to touch for a second on threats to sandy beaches and dunes before we start talking specifically about snowy plovers. Coastal development and shoreline armoring are um, challenging along the coast because um, they lock up sediment and they don't allow beaches to move around naturally. They don't allow sand to move around naturally and that, that sand is, is locked up permanently. Um, the same thing happens with sand mining or removal of nuisance blowing sand. Typically that is taken elsewhere or used for other products and it's removed from the sand supply on beaches um, and it just results in, in um, these sort of diminishing beaches. Um, in our region of Monterey Bay, we don't really have beach grooming, but in Southern California, it's really, really common to remove the rack from the beach. Um, and that's potentially a real problem because you're removing the you're removing a key link in the food chain. High impact recreation has this sort of the same, you know, deleterious effects on sandy beaches, um, things like off highway vehicles. Um, you can see a lot of vehicle tracks in this picture or other high impact forms of recreation also sort of break down this key link in um, the trophic system. And then of course, everybody is aware of how climate change is affecting um, natural systems everywhere. And one of the really key things that's happening on coastlines is sea level rise. And so I'm asking you all to just ponder for a sec, what's missing from this photo? I hope that the, the slides we just saw are were illu illuminating in that respect. So there's pretty much no rack, right, on this beach. and um, so this is not going to be a great place for snowy plovers. It's not going to be a great place for other shorebirds that are, you know, dependent on those rack inputs. And I just want to show you a little bit of a, um, a slide here. Um, this is from one of our colleagues' research projects. Um, we know shorebirds increase as invertebrates increase. And this just shows you a plot of that with mean number of individual invertebrates on the horizontal axis and the mean number of shorebirds on the vertical axis. And you can see that increasing relationship. And so we know that by proxy, when we lose rack, which is the food for inver invertebrates, we lose the invertebrates, we also lose the shorebirds. This is a really key thing in coastal ecosystems. So now I'm going to move into talking a little bit more about Western snowy plovers um, and how wonderful they are. Um, I personally never get enough of looking at how beautiful they are. This is a male in full breeding plumage. You guys can see some of the key features, and this might be something that Jack might want to go back to later. Um, you can see the black collar patches, the black eye patch, the black forehead patch, and then that, that light rufous or rusty cap. Um, so this photo was probably taken early in the breeding season when this male's um, plumage was really bright. And, you know, I already kind of showed some slides of habitat, but this is a really lovely aerial view of one of our field sites in Monterey Bay, California, Salinas River National Wildlife Refuge. You can see the Salinas Valley in the background, um, lots of agricultural lands adjacent to the refuge. You see the river coming out to the left of this photo is a big sandbar, the river mouth, which is full of plovers. These coastal dunes, which in this case are backed by this beautiful marsh, are a really key nesting area for snowy plovers in the Monterey Bay area. And this is the type of habitat that is their favored habitat across um, the range of the Pacific Coast population. Um, and I think this year in 2023, we had uh, maybe 50 nests in this area that you can see right here, 50 snowy plover nests. So I already mentioned this kind of whole coastal ecosystem trophic um, linkage. Um, we know how important kelp rack is. I want to just mention something really specific about plovers, again, from maybe from a nature, nature journaling standpoint. When you look at the plover, I hope this photo really, I hope it really stands out how big that eye is of that bird. Um, the, the, the eyes in the plovers and all species of plovers take up a really big part of their cranium. And that's because they're visual predators. So they are spotting prey visually and then grabbing it. The same way, like if you're familiar with a flycatcher, which is a, a type of songbird, um, they're sort of sallying out and grabbing insects. That's what snowy plovers are doing. Those big juicy pods of amphipods that we saw on the previous slides, they're sort of grabbing those and they're eating other stuff like kelp flies. Um, if you look at a snowy plover relative to other species of shorebirds, when you think about sandpipers, they're tactile foragers and they're probing within sand or other sediments and they're sensing, they have really good sensory capabilities on their bills. 
Um, they don't have the same ocular development in their cranium that these guys have. And the other interesting fact is that snowy plovers have a really high percentage of rods to cones so that they can see in low light levels because they are visual predators and that allows them to forage really early in the morning and really late at night. So just more basic things on their natural history. Here's a male attending a very young chick. One of the things that makes them different than other species of shorebirds is that they nest in temperate latitudes. And so what does that mean? So that means that the latitudes that humans live at by and large, um, many, many species of shorebirds and the group of shorebirds are nesting in high Arctic latitudes. And so they're not really coming into conflict with humans directly when they're on their breeding grounds. Um, that makes the species really unique. Their, their habitat of beaches is obviously a favored uh, recreational area for humans too. Um, they have sequential pair bonds throughout the season. And what that means, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a subsequent slide, but what that means is they mate multiple times with multiple individuals. Um, they have precocial young, and what precocial means is that they hatch and they're ready to leave the nest within a few hours of hatching, which is really one of the most remarkable facts about um, this species and also the entire group of shorebirds. And that's an adaptation to nesting in a terrestrial environment on the ground where there are predators. They need to leave the nest early. And then they employ this crypsis and camouflage strategy, which is a really fancy way of saying they blend in with the background. And I think you can see that here really well with both the male and with the chick. And we'll get to see some shots of eggs here in a little bit. And so a little bit more on their reproduction. This is a female at a nest. Um, some of the stuff I already mentioned, but it's quite a long breeding season. They start nesting in early March and they will nest all the way through September. Um, and so what that does is it enables the sequential pair bonds that I already mentioned. And the sex roles really are different female versus male. Um, clearly the female is the one who's laying the eggs and that clutch equals about 20% of the female's um, body weight every time she lays it. And I think you can see in this photo how big those three eggs are that are right in front of that female. So it's a huge physiologic effort for the female to lay those eggs. Um, so they've evolved this very interesting uh, mating system in which once the nest hatches, the male actually takes over care of the chicks. This is very um, a, a very widespread strategy, again, in the shorebird world, but it's not very common in the bird world. There's a few other groups of birds that do this, but um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I already mentioned this kind of highly precocial chick um, strategy. So this is just a, a cute a compendium of cute chick shots. Uh, this chick's probably about maybe 10 days old. Uh, but, you know, again, a really precocial chick, it's nestling in and among and around probably looks like some dried red algae, which provides, you know, food for insects. So it's got stuff to eat. Um, those eggs in that nest hatch synchronously, which is another one of those adaptations to leave the nest quickly. And as I've already mentioned, these chicks are self-feeding. So there's there's nobody bringing junior, you know, breakfast. Junior has to go out and start, you know, foraging for his or her own breakfast um, pretty much within a few hours of, of hatching. So they're, they're, they're truly remarkable and resilient birds in that respect and, and unlike um, many other species. So I want to talk a little bit about um, some of their really unique behaviors. Um, so as we kind of transit from the incubation phase, which takes about four weeks of both birds incubating around the clock, into the nest hatching and then into the chick rearing, you might see this behavior, which if you've ever seen a kill deer and you know what a kill deer is, this is the so-called broken wing display. So this bird is dragging its tail and, and stretching its wings out to try to uh, lure the potential predator, which in this case is the photographer, away from either its eggs or its chicks. And this also is another really unique thing that um, that plovers and other shorebirds do when there are predators around their nest. And it's an, it's an anti-predator strategy. Um, so for all of you who might visit Pacific Coast beaches with snowy plovers, if you ever see this display going on, we call it, um, in, the, in our world, we call it the lure display, you're probably really near a nest or really near chicks. And it's probably a good idea to just kind of back away a little bit and give them some space. And they'll usually just return to whatever they were doing, whether it was incubating um, or um, brooding chicks. So this is kind of a neat one. And I, I see people eagerly looking up and down. So it's kind of a neat one to sketch, I think. Um, more, there's more, there's more cuteness coming. And so as, as the nest is hatching, we can see here a female in the very early hours of attending a nest. You can see the chick's little head there. 
Um, the female will usually stick around with the male. It varies, but she'll stick around right when the nest is just starting to hatch. And then at some point, um, the male will take over and then he's got responsibility for about the next four weeks when it comes to fledging the chicks. Um, so not to say that the females are not good mothers, um, but they just evolved this really um, interesting system. Um, and so the male takes over. This is a really, really young chick. You guys can see if you look at the end of that bill there, you can see that little white dot. That's actually an egg tooth. And that's what the chick uses um, to pick, pip its way out of the egg. So that's how it breaks the surface of the egg. So this chick is less than a day old. And it's probably fewer than 12 hours old. Um, and then this is, he, there's probably another chick under there as well, but this is the very, very attentive father of this chick. Um, when these chicks are young, they need to be brooded almost consistently throughout the day in order to stay warm. And you can imagine on some of these windy, cold California beaches that um, they need to be brooded quite frequently. And this is what starts to happen as the chicks get older. Um, the male essentially is their guardian. He's their watchdog. These chicks are probably, I don't know, 15 to 18 days old. And um, they're starting to become a little bit more independent. They still have spots. Um, and so he's just looking for danger and they're just zipping around, um, you know, trying to find food and, and running to him as necessary. Um, so this is what he spends his four weeks, day and night doing, if you can imagine that. And, and, you know, some of you are probably parents and imagine having three small children at the same time who are running in all directions from you. That's what this would be like. And then finally, at the end of that four week period, we end up with a beautiful fledgling that is capable of flight. One of the neat natural history details here, you, there's a couple of ways you can tell this is a fledgling. First of all, you can see that really neat white scalloping on the feathers that is only present in um, young of the year birds. You can also see how crisp and fresh its wing feathers are there towards its tail. And you can see that the tail barely extends beyond the wings. So that tail is just starting to grow. And that's just a characteristic in general for young of the year birds that is, you know, if you're a bird watcher that you're probably familiar with. Um, so I, I'm always amazed um, that four weeks of eating amphipods and flies produces such a, a, a change in, you know, these, these chicks will go from weighing about five grams when they hatch to weighing about 40 grams four weeks later. So I have a video for you guys and I hope that the sound works. I'm gonna go ahead and play it. Um, and this is a male at a nest. It was taken some years back. So it's not the Christmas video, but it's a really neat um, insight into what goes on at the nest. You'll see the young chicks, the hatching nest and the male um, doing a few interesting things. And then there's a follow-up video. So some interesting stuff going on there. Yeah, and let's go to the next one and we'll get to see the part two. I never really get tired of watching that. <laughs> um, and so there were interesting things going on in that video. You could see the male take the eggshells away. 
Um, you could see the third chick that was a little bit behind the other two. You could see how the two older chicks came right back to the male to be brooded. And the most interesting thing, I think, is the way that the male and the chicks vocalize to each other to communicate. So a super duper intimate view into what goes on at the nest. And, um, you know, again, you could see how on a sandy beach, like a really tenacious bird, but a, a pretty fragile, vulnerable bird, too, at the same, you know, token um, to things like human disturbance or vehicles or things like that. So I kind of want to shift gears a little bit here in the kind of final little section and talk a little bit about our research and monitoring. Um, our project here in Monterey Bay has been going on since 1984. Um, you can see the logos of all our partners there. We work super closely with all of the land managers and you know regulatory groups and this voluntary conservation collaborative. Many of our partners monitor plovers alongside with us on their lands. Um, you can see on the right the range map of the snowy plover, which breeds from Southern Washington, all the way down through Baja on coastal coastal areas. And that's the listed Pacific Coast population, which was federally listed as threatened um, in 1993. So what do we do when we're monitoring? Well, that we do a variety of things, but one of the primary things that we do is locate nests and the, determine the fate of the nest. And that means, did the nest hatch or did it fledge? And in order for us to do that, we have to follow that nest from the moment we find it, from the day we find it until the day that it hatches. And that can be up to four weeks, as we mentioned earlier, that's how long those, those go. Um, then we also are present when a portion of the nest hatch and we individually color ban the chicks um, so that we can determine whether or not they fledge. Um, we do also ban some of the adults within our population to have a little bit more information on their identity. Um, and for all of our banding, we individually color ban these birds. So um, like, for example, this bird in the hand, the adult is in the process of becoming yellow, orange, yellow, orange, it's being rebanded from a different combination, um, and which is one of my favorite combos of all time, yo-yo. Um, and you can follow this bird once it's individually banded, not just here in Monterey Bay, but if it goes to other places across the range, and we'll look at some of what that we've learned from that in a second. And so since 1984, we've banded more than 16,000 um, chicks and adults on this project, which is a lot, of, a lot of color combinations. This is, I love this photo. This is from 2023, taken by a, a Bradley Dunbaugh, friend of the project. So this is a female with her individual color band brooding all three of her chicks with their individual color bands. And so you can see there's a lot of variation in there, but those bands really are incredibly useful to us. Um, and then once the chicks fledge, either fledge or don't fledge, um, we never have to handle them again after, after they hatch. Um, and this is really great because they'll wear that combination for the rest of their life. And it gives us um, a lot of really interesting information about the birds. And, and this chick right here that you can see on the right is aqua green, blue, white. And that fledgling was just reported to us today from somewhere else along the coast of California. So we learn a lot about their movements um, when, we, when we individually color ban them. But you can also see too, what a hard job it is for an adult to brood <laughs> three chicks. And then the older they get, the harder it is. And so just segueing right into what have we learned about snowy plovers? We've learned some really interesting things. This female right here, her combinations, yellow, red, green, yellow. You might be able to notice that those bands on the left leg, the yellow, red leg are quite thin. And that's because this is the oldest female we ever recorded in our population here. That's why the photo is not that crisp because it's from a while ago and she lived to be 15 years um, old. The average lifespan of a snowy plover is about four years. And this is all information that you can get when you individually mark birds. We also learn about their annual survival. So we know that males live a little bit, they survive at a little bit of a higher rate than females. And that may be because of that physiologic demand of laying those eggs, which is pretty, pretty significant. And then we also know that first year birds, and this is really common in the world of birds, do not survive as well as adults. So um, in some cases, maybe as, as, as low as a third of the survival of adult across that first winter when they're learning about their environment. Our a fun fact is that our most successful male fledged 34 young in his 12 year lifespan, which is absolutely phenomenal if you think about that contribution to the population. We've learned again, as I just mentioned with that previous chick, aqua green, blue, white, we've learned a lot about dispersal patterns. And so we might have something like this where we have snowy plovers that are say banded up in the Point Reyes area and they disperse down towards Morro Bay. Um, and then we also have things like this. Um, but one of the things that we have learned, and and so plovers don't sort of snowy plovers don't follow the sort of traditional 
birds are in a certain area to breed and they go south in the winter. They do a mix of staying resident in their breeding locations um, or wintering in a different location than they breed. Um, so we have a mix here um, in the winter time of plovers from other areas and plovers from Monterey Bay. And then we also have migrants that disappear from Monterey Bay that come back here. And we know a lot about where these migrants winter because they're individually color banded. One thing that we do know about movements is that the majority of movements of birds when they disperse from their natal site, so that's their first year, are within about 100 kilometers of their natal site. So these really long distance dispersals are, are less common. And then what kind of data does monitoring produce? So this is our long-term data set. You know, the Point Blue sort of specializes in these long-term data sets that Ann mentioned and I mentioned at the outset. So this is just the hatch rate and the flood rate in Monterey Bay from the year 2000 to the year 2022, which is only about half of our data set. And so you can see, you know, there's a lot of variability in those rates, but there's maybe some concerns with some declining trends in these rates. And then we, this is our Monterey Bay regional population. Um, and we have a population target of 338. And you can see that we've met that target in a lot of the last, you know, say about approximately 20 years, but not in every year. Um, and that we did have a pretty significant decline from 2015 on. Um, so this is another one of those things that this sort of long-term monitoring is really important um, uh, to sort of get a handle on. Um, and the, the way that we're able to do this is we just, we go out and count the birds um, every year. We do something that's called a, a range-wide window survey, which crosses um, the entire breeding range of the snowy plover. And everybody goes out the same week to count the plovers at their site. And then we add them all up. Um, and then we get the, the entire population total and the smaller regional totals. I just wanted to touch really briefly, we've got maybe one slide left after this, um, on uh, what are the causes of population decline for the species? Oh, okay, they're not, are they? Oh, they're here, I see. <laughs> I need to minimize. Um, I'm not gonna talk in depth about any of these. If, if people have any questions or are interested in this, I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, predators are significant for snowy plovers. As I mentioned, their whole ecology is around um, anti-predator stuff, everything from camouflage to the way they behave. Human disturbance is a big factor for these temperate nesting shorebirds. And, and not only are they temperate nesting, but they nest in a habitat that's really favored by humans for recreation. Long-term landscape change on the coast, everything from conversion of lands to urban areas, but also adjacent areas like agricultural areas. Um, being changed to have changed the predator communities. Um, and then we have these what we call stochastic or random events. And those things can be things like oil spills that can affect big portions of the population. And we have had a couple of those in the last um, 20 or 30 years. And then also we, you know, we have concerns always with rare populations uh, or low, small populations about things like, um, you know, genetic problems when populations become too small. And that was, is sort of an intrinsic characteristic of a population that can cause it to decline. The really big issues for snowy plovers across the Pacific coast are predators and human disturbance and landscape change is really driving both of those things. So, um, you know, even though we say predators are a big factor, those predators are really driven by humans. I just wanted to mention those. You might be wondering, you know, what you can do personally if you're interested in snowy plovers, if you're if you're a person who lives coastally, or maybe you're not a person who lives coastally. Well, you can always go to our webpage and see the work that we're doing in Sandy Beach and Dune Ecosystems. You can support Point Blue. If you're if you're interested in doing something in your community, one of the best things that you can do is get involved in any community based you know, efforts for conservation. And this could range from um, things like um, habitat restoration to, you know, participating in beach cleanups. Um, it could range into, you know, volunteering to look at snowy plovers um, in the wintertime at your sites. Um, there are just a number of different ways that you could get involved in helping with plover conservation. I like to think that the best thing that we can do is kind of take our conservation ethic with us when we go to beaches and um, you know, treat it as if we are stewards of the the site, even even if we're not. And you know, that means you know, picking up garbage, talking talking to other people that might be you know walking in closed areas, expressing concerns, um, helping educate other people if you have the knowledge to do so. Um, and that's a lot of what we do. Um, that's a lot of what our team does when we're actually out there in the field is is have one on one conversations with people and and hope that we can convince them that this is something worth uh, protecting and preserving. And that's all I have.
Wow, thank you so much. That was fantastic and um, adorable <laughs> and love the video. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you captured all that. And I know we have a lot of questions, but Jack, should I turn it back to you to kind uh, of yeah. uh, run well, the- uh, Chris, thank you so much for, uh, for that. There's, um... Oh, so I'm going to add myself into the spotlight here. Hi. Um, so um, I, I first have, have um, I, I've, I've got a bunch of thoughts. But before I, but before I do, um, I think this might be a good, uh, you talked about ways that people can make a difference with this when you're kind of out in a place, sort of in your mind, uh, having the mindset of, of, of a steward where you can, picking things up, helping educate people about, um, you know, we're staying out of the closed areas. It's a temporary inconvenience, but it's going to protect these, this, this little system there. You can imagine if I were running my dogs in that area where those little ping pong balls were scampering about, that would not be a good thing. Um, the, that, that that mindset, I think, is very very useful for us to have wherever we go, but we can really see the impact that it would have on this system. Um, another way that we can um, support uh, support these birds is to further support this kind of research. Um, and um, before we kind of go into question and answers here, um, I want to point out right that right now there's kind of an interesting opportunity if you would like to. Kind of get involved in supporting this kind of, of research. Point Blue Conservation Science has a really fun event that's going on right now, which is a major fundraiser, which will um, support a ton of their work going forward. Um, and could I bring you in to sort of talk about the the, the birdathon? Absolutely. This, this is something that a lot of people there, there are a number of people in the nature journaling community who are already involved in this. And so tell us about it. Yes, absolutely. So Point Blue does a birdathon. Here's our logo and da, 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 wait for it. Oh. This is our 45th annual Rich Stall Cup birdathon. And what we do is we form teams, and this is over a whole month and it's going on right now. Um, we form teams to go out and count birds in different areas. And we have such fun teams like the Orna cycles who go riding bikes, mountain bikes out in John Muir Woods, not John Muir Law Woods, but you know, okay. Yeah. Um, and they're counting birds and we have an equestrian group that does it all from horseback. Chris, you should be part of that. <laughs> um, we have the fledglings and they are inexperienced birders. So anybody can do this and join a team. And we're so excited because we formed a team with Amy Tan, the author who supports, I'm into coffee mugs today, Wild Wonder. Right. <laughs> and uh, Amy is leading a team and we'll have our couple of our top avian ecologists with us from Point Blue. And guess the name of the team? Are you looking for a pun today, Jack? It's the Tanagers. What the Amy Tanagers? I think you get it. Let's see what you okay. did there. <laughs> um, and Lishka just put in the in the chat how you can support the Tanagers. And what people typically do, they either make a donation of a certain amount just to support the team, or they might say, I'll give you X amount, $5, $10 for every species that you find, or maybe they'll put up another challenge or something. So um, it's really fun, really great way to get in, involved. And um, I must say our merch here, this is, um, this year it's the Sawwet Owl is our, what, mascot. And this is artwork by our scientific illustrator intern who just finished her eight week internship, mm -hmm. Maya Amix. Um, so very excited about that. Um, what else should I say about it? Lishka, you could jump in if you want to say anything else, but we'd love to have you um, support our our team, uh, the the Tanagers. It's a lot of fun. So yeah, uh, 
I just I, I would like to say that just you know philanthropy by by not by 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 sort of small donations from from individuals makes a huge difference in the success of organizations. And this is a kind of fun way to get involved with it. And the um and just sort of realize that when you do that, it is supporting on the back end all of this research. The, the, the research then allows us to be in a place to make decisions. Um, so um uh and also if you'd like to become a member of Point Ray's uh, Point Ray's Observatory, um of Point Blue Conservation Science, um, you can do that as well. Um, and uh, there are lots of ways to to sort of follow and get involved with the things that they do. We're going to have, uh, we're already planning another discussion about some of the penguin work that is going on um, with 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 Point Blue, and we'll have another workshop on that and an update on the penguin situation. Um, yes. So really respect and appreciate the, the work you're doing. And we really appreciate everybody's contribution, whether it is volunteering, whether it's providing support, telling your friends about us, building up our community. Financial is always very welcome, whatever is comfortable for you. But there are many, many ways to support us and get involved, and we appreciate all of it. Oh, thank you so much, Anne. Um, so, uh, Chris, um, I've got. To, I want to pepper with you a couple of questions. Then I'm going to show a few tricks on drawing these lovely little beasties, and then um, the uh, we'll we'll open it up to uh, to to. There's some people writing questions into the chat, which the the team is is answering. There will also be available for questions on all these topics at the end here. Um, so I've got just just two to 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 to, to hit you with. One is I noticed that when you're banding these chicks, I didn't see a little fish and wildlife service band on them. Um, is there no fish and wildlife service band? And what's the thinking behind that? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the unique things that we do is that we don't have have a federal band when we ban chicks. Um, it's just sort of something that's evolved um, over the years for us. Um, and the reason that we do it is because we observed what we thought was a slight increase in injury rates associated with metal bands on ch on chicks, not when they were chicks, but as as adults. And so there was a point at which we we transitioned to that. And so the majority of our projects, so Point Blue also leads projects at Vandenberg Space Force Base and also at Oceano Dunes. And we also do all the technical banding, not all of it, but a lot of it at Point Reyes National Seashore. So all across California, we have sort of shifted um, this methodology over time in, in response to you know, essentially anecdotal observations of injury rates, but we just always want to be implementing best safety practices. And so, yes, if a bird is um, recaptured, we are noting its identity from its color combination, not from its federal band number. That's really cool. I yeah. I, I, I like that to sort of think that you're you're paying attention to these things really, really closely. And what's what's also I want to notice here: changing your behaviors. Um, in and and sort of and I, I want people to kind of notice what Chris said. She said it's just anecdotal information. Um, so in science, anecdote, um, like I saw this once, these sorts of things, doesn't give us really strong evidence for 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 moving on. But sometimes it's the best that you can get. And so um, scientists pay tons of attention to data and a lot of times you'll hear science talk about you know anecdotes are not good data and that's true but notice that <clears throat> for the safety of these birds the scientists are changing their practices around how they ban these birds based on anecdote and so that also shows great plasticity of mind with the welfare of the birds foremost in your mind and so i respect that yeah, and if I, if I could just add one other thing on that, uh, you know, we recently went through a process with all these projects I just mentioned at Point Blue. We have an internal snowy plover research and conservation group, and we did sort of a hive mind approach to our best management practices for working 
doing snowy plover research. And we addressed all of these things in a really large internal document that we produced um, that was the distillation of probably a combined 150 years of experience monitoring these birds. Um, and for, for a couple of reasons, one, so that we had standards, but also so that we could re reduce the impacts of our research to the minimum level that, that, that it needed to be, because it's something that's incredibly important to us when we're doing, you know, this type of research. Um, and we were really thrilled that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the main stewardship organization for the species, um, because it's federally listed, um, took our guide and is using it for some of their standards now to help develop permit requirements. Um, so that came out of, you know, this sort of institutional knowledge that Point Blue has from doing long-term monitoring, which is what you get when you do long-term monitoring. You learn things, you learn things, uh, whether you're, you know, you, some of the things you learn, you're not trying to learn. <laughs> you learn them anyways. <laughs> and, and it's also neat to think of just sort of, instead of kind of going forward, we're doing this thing be, this way because we've always done it this way. You're getting all the different players together and figuring out what actually are best practices and being willing to change what you do. The, the, the very notion <laughs> of changing what I'm doing implies that I may not be doing things the best possible way right now. And that's a vulnerability that a lot of people don't want to face. So that's like, no, this is just the way we've always done it. Yep. And so also I just, I, I, I want to kind of note this mental plasticity as a way of responding to um, that we, we change what we do in the presence of evidence, or in this case of uh, anecdote. So um, on both those points, I think that's that's fantastic. So I've got one other kind of odd question. Um, I noticed on that little graph at the, with the blue line and the, the, the green line showing the um, the number of nests and the fledging rates. Yep, hatch rates and fledge rates, yes. Yep. So ha hatch rates and fledge rates. So in the past, there were greater hatch rates and the fledge rates were still low. Now the hatch rates and the fledge rates, they're both lower, but the hatch rate came down much faster. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, which kind of gave gave me two questions. One is, um, what is the reason that um, hatch rates are down mm -hmm. now? And the second is, what is the reason that fledge rates are not um, are if if they were kind of going down at the same slope mm -hmm. yeah um, there's there's like once you've hatched your chances seem to be a little bit better now <laughs> so something seems to be better for ones it's 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 harder to hatch but once you've hatched you're going to do better so what's yeah. going on with those two things does that yeah it's, it's a really uh astute question jack and i think that the you know one thing for people to think about um and this is true for all creatures not just snowy plovers is that different factors affect different life stages right so for us our hatch rates and somebody is asking a little question about these rates in the chat our hatch rate is just did the nest hatch or did it not hatch and then our fledge rate is did any chicks from the chicks that hatched fledge or not so it's just a sort of yes no for for each of those um, and so what we have right now, or we've had was reflected in that figure is in recent years, hatch rates have been really heavily impacted by one particular thing that is not as much of a problem for chicks. And that is common ravens. Um, so people are probably pretty aware of the number of ravens and also crows, which as a group, we call corvids in the landscape, um, that I talked about landscape change earlier, driving changes in predator communities. And corvids, both crows and ravens, have been incredibly adaptable um, to these changes in the landscape. And common ravens prior to 2007 did not occur on coastal beaches in Monterey Bay. They simply did not occur. And because their populations have been in exponential growth now for quite a while, um, and that's not just here, that's throughout the entire American West, um, they're causing huge depressive population problems for sage grouse, for Mojave um, desert tortoise, snowy plovers, marbled merlets, 
California lease turns. Um, and it's a really hard thing to handle. So those hatch rates are really reflecting that that ravens are specializing on that life stage and and probably not as much as you pointed out, Jack, on the chicks once they hatch. Um, and part of the reason is that the way ravens hunt snowy plover nests is they just fly over the environment and they do this really interesting loop to loop kind of roller coaster flight. They flush plovers directly off their nests and they don't even have to look for the nest. They just go right to it. And so because chicks are more mobile and they're scattered, they can't really use that exact same approach to hunt chicks. So yeah. they're probably one of the most successful nest predators ever invented. And because we monitor snowy plovers so closely, we know the impacts that they have on them. But um, we also know, again, anecdotally, that the slide I showed you guys, Slings River National Wildlife Refuge, used to have uh, multiple species of nesting waterfowl, a couple other species of nesting shorebirds. And they they basically virtually are not there present nesting anymore because of predation from common ravens. So they're a problem and um, there's not a lot of solutions except for removing those ravens that are causing problems. Um, and that is um, really only a partial solution because of the abundance of ravens in the landscape. So yeah, it's a very astute and question. The, the minute you things. start trying to do something to manage those ravens, they're going to notice what those uh, strategies are and adapt to it because right. They're yep. such they're so good at figuring things out. That's, that's that's really, really difficult. That's very, very true. They're very, very difficult to manage. And um yeah, it, it it's it's again, it's not it the ravens are abundant because of us, right? So it's 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 not something that um is going to change anytime soon in terms of the landscape, you know, subsidies that are being provided to ravens. And that's things like, you know, garbage water, nest sites, things that just weren't present for them in these places historically are, are really abundant now. And wow. I was in the, I was camping in Joshua Tree a couple of years ago and the ravens there, there was a raven nest right there. And, you know, they're historically, they've been in the desert, but they're much greater numbers. And the ravens were going into the, the nice developed um, bathroom in the um, park, walking in and pulling the toilet paper off the roll and taking it to their nest for nest material. <laughs> As the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. Those are very smart. The ravens know that they can go in there and get it, and then they walk back out. And anyway, it, they're they're incredibly adaptable to what they have at hand. That's that's really really interesting. So <laughs> what I want to encourage people to do is to write down any questions that you have for um, either uh, Chris or or Anne. Um, and then we're going to be returning to them in a little bit. I just wanted to show you, because I want to encourage people to go out to the coast. Um, and um, for, for this, having binoculars is a wonderful thing because that way you're not going to be distracting or disturbing the beasties while, while you're there. Um, and so staying out of the areas that are closed. But should you see a plover, I want to help you be able to sketch the plover that you see. Um, and then we'll come back for a little bit of Q&A here. All right. Um, Chris, thank you very much. Um, now, let's talk plover time. Plover time. Bow, now, now, now. Um, one moment. Got this going. And my... All right, I am going to, uh, I've, I've got this new nifty system that is not working today of, of easily showing um, slides and my tablet at the same time, but because it's not working, I am going to uh, hold on a moment. screen and so camera there I go All right I I'm, I'm going to show you um, a sort of split screen arrangement where we're going to have um, a we'll be able to to see some of my drawings but we'll also be able to see some kind of fun cleverness. 
I'm going to share my desktop with you. Zoom. Share screen and let's go for the desktop. There we go. Um, there it is. Uh, snowy plovers, bless their little snowy plover hearts. Um, there is. Where's that? Uh, do do you read the uh, uh, Chris? Do you read the right leg first? So would this be blue over white, blue over green, uh, or would this be blue over green, blue over white? It's left leg first, top to bottom, right leg, top to bottom. So as a so left to right. So um blue, green, blue, white. Yes. <laughs> so blue, green, blue, white. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh and I'm seeing fine little feather edges. I'm seeing that crescent there. So is this a little fledgling then? Yes, this is a this is was banded in this year, this year, I think, or maybe it was last year. Yeah, but this is a very young bird. All right. Um, so I'm using a combination of your photographs and also some photographs from uh, Vivek Kenzode, uh, birdpixel.com. So if you want to go sketch more of these after that, you can head right over to birdpixel. And let's take a look here at um, at, at how to hear my kind of sketch notes of what was going on here today. Um, but if I want to draw a little portrait of, of one of these lovely little beasties, um, here's the general approach that I take. What I do is I start with, I start with looking at that angle along its back. So if you were to pet the plover, which is, I guess, a very nice thing to do here, just imagine your hand coming across across the back of the head of that plover, right? On its head and its back. And then you get down a little bit further and notice that your hand drops down and back out onto that tail. So as you pet the plover, there's this little change in angle of that. So when I start to do a drawing, it starts with pet the plover. And so down the back and head, down the little slope and over. And then what I'm doing is I'm attaching a head onto that. And something that makes this look cute is the fact that it has a really, really big head and then a really big eye in the head. So if you draw something and it has a big head, right? Here's this little person, right? This one is cute, right? This one here is not cute. So big heads just appeal to us as, as cute. So I'm gonna put in a little ball here thinking this is a rather large head. And then I want to look at, kind of pet the bird under its chin and feel this little kind of belly slip. So it kind of, there's a little scoop around the belly. And so I get this, what's what artists call the negative shape, which is this shape out here. So when you're not looking at the bird, you're just looking at the shape of the air behind it, the negative shape in the front, with a little head in between, that then gives me the basic structure of this. And then it'll be a little kind of cone sticking out here. That is, that's my basic format for this shape. So number one, pet the plover. Number two, make sure your head is big enough. Number three, that little kind of curve on the front, and then that's where you're going to place your body ball into it. Before you go any further, just kind of double check, look at it and sort of see, is there anything I need to change about this before I put any detail on? In this case, looking at it, I think that this body wants to be a little bit more of an oval. So I'm going to change this little line to come out here. And just like that, I've changed the proportions of the bird. If I had waited till the end of the drawing, it would have been too late to do that. So step one, get the plover. Step two, big old head. Step three, neck, throat, belly shape right in here. Four, I'm blocking this in. And then I'm just double checking around when it's still in this kind of light wireframe state. And that's going to help me get in 
uh, so changes in proportion. Now, let's start to put in some details. The beak, I'm going to put just a little line in here. The eye and the beak line up on the same line. And so that's going to help me place my big eye, which is going to go back here. And it's going to be closed, but I'm using that just to sort of block it in. We're going to make that kind of a sleepy eye in a moment. The beak lines up with that. And what I want to do is not make my beak too long. And I don't want to make it too short. So I'm going to use this bird's head as a little measuring tool. If I take, uh, take this beak and I kind of look at the head length, so if I kind of go back here, if I were to take this beak and flip it into the head, would it reach the back? Would it just be a little bump in front? I'm seeing it as being roughly a half a head length. So that's going to get me to stop my beak somewhere in there. This lovely little plover has feet that are sticking out on the bottom. And I'm going to note where in this curve do they come in? Do they attach back here? Do they attach in here? These ones are attaching somewhere in here. Note that that other leg is at a slightly different angle. You're going to see that a lot. Everybody always draws the legs of birds as parallel lines. But when you start looking around at a lot of birds, you're going to see that that's usually not like you see, because we see one at a slightly different angle. And we're kind of losing those, those feet into the ground here. Maybe we want to make those feet a little, those legs a little bit longer. Than the the leg down there. See, at this stage, it's easy to make changes. I think I'd still need a little bit longer legs. I want to still for even longer than that. Kind of cool to think, like one of the things that's going to really help this thing survive is these little long legs. Little long legs. Um, now, we're going to start to block in some details. Actually, maybe before that, there's one other kind of bit of negative shape. Once again, it's your negative shape. Um, that really, really helps the drawing like this. And that's what's going on right here on the bird's forehead. And look at this. There's a steep angle up. And then there's an inflection point where it turns. And then there's a flat top. That is going to um, really help this be a, 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 a clever shape. my beak, I double check again, kind of looking around, yeah, roughly these proportions seem to be working for me. All right, if I've got head stuff going up here, there's a big white throat. I'm now gonna use a bunch of what are called na negative shapes to place pieces of this plumage. So negative shapes are, again, where you're not looking at, I'm not looking at, uh, the, the feature that I'm drawing, but the shapes that are around the feature. So I'm going to look at what is the shape of its throat. There's sort of a little triangle of the throat up in here. Then there is a uh, little shoulder bar. Let's look at the shape of the white belly. It is a crescent starting down in here, and it's curving up. And I want to look at how much white belly is there in comparison to how much back. A little bit more back than belly. All right. So here is wing. I'm putting in just sort of a big ball. There are some flight feathers that are sticking down below that. You can see other parts of the wing sticking out here. And there are wingtips that are sticking further out here. What a darling little bird. So I've got this sort of light, sketchy drawing. What I'm going to do now is draw on top of this with, I'm going to change colors here. Um, I will often do kind of preliminary drawings like this with a light, non photo blue pencil. It allows me to do all these sort of basic block in lines. 
in a really ghosty way that then doesn't get in my, uh, once I start adding details on top of it, my brain doesn't notice these blue ones, but this doesn't show up very well on the screen. That's why I'm using a you know, bright orange pencil for you. All right, so, but now once I've got that, once I've got that, that basic shape, I can start to put in more details. Looks like I've got the forehead angle wrong. It's rocked back at a little bit like that. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to start over here by its beak. There is the upper portion. The lower portion comes down and back. And then the separation between the upper and lower bill goes further back into the head. So there's a little scoop of white feathers here. There's a big scoop of tail feathers up here. And then notice how on the underside of the, the, the bill, the chin feathers stick out here. So the beak isn't attaching into the head like this. There are fed parts of the beak that are going into the head and then there are parts of the feathers that are going out on the beak so that you've got these two things coming together. This is going to help your beak feel more attached to your head. And so I'm going to got a line that's coming roughly down like this. And I'm going to suggest that it's a little bit feathery in here by making a few little flick marks like this. Just a few little kind of flicks in here. And that little part is feathery. Let's zoom down on that. coming here around the front the belly of the bird. And I can suggest that this is fluffy. This with a few little, I'm quite kind of putting my pencil tip down a little bit more forcefully and flicking it back up like that. I'm using the bilberry marks. I could William D. Berry, but I saw I use an approach like that. Let's get the shape of the head and the eye in. So I want to make sure that I don't put the eye too close to the beak. And I don't want to put it too far back on the head here. So let's see. I have started this here. And if I look at that, that's going to be a little bit too close. Yeah. Yeah. See, look at that. I put sort of blocked in my eye in the wrong spot. That eye may be more back here. Oh, that's too far. I'm going to try to just put a dot in where the front of that should be. Yeah. Somewhere in there. And it's going to go back to here. It's so sleepy looking fledgling. <laughs> we'll take a little nap. Um, when you're drawing a, a bird eye like this, to make this eye look really alive, pay attention to that little kind of ring of feathers around the eye. Don't do this. Don't have your little eye slip like this and then draw a line over it and a line around that. I want this to sort of feel feathery. So I'm making a little kind of hit, go, hit, come and going line around it. And also draw a little circle up here in the eye. And what I'm going to do then is fill in on that. And that becomes a little glint of sunlight on that eye. And that, then that eye feels wet. That little glint of sunlight does a lot. All right. I have a little bird forehead here. I'm going to put a few little flicks into that, suggesting that it's fluffy. Go up here to the top of the crown and the head, and then down. Now stop here. Notice this. Here's a little subtle thing. There's a little moment here. 
And what you're seeing is that the feathers poof out just slightly in here. That's the bird's, the nape of its neck. And at that little point there, you'll, you'll often see on, on, on bird heads, here's, here's my, my little birdie. Start looking for it. You will often see as that head comes down, you'll see a little in the nape area, a little puff out there. Those feathers can fluff out different differently than the rest of the, the, the bird's feathers. And so if you start looking for these little nape fluffs, you'll find them. So I, I, I caught, it'd be really easy just to make that one big straight line and not get that little nape pooch. But start looking around, you're gonna see it. Um, so we're then coming over the back here. Let's put some feathers in on this bird's head. Sorry for driver drawing off screen there from the look at this. Um, so in the nape here, we have feathers that are coming down. There's going to be a light area that goes across the forehead. And here what I'm doing is my eyes are flickering back and forth between how big is the white section, how big is the brown section, how big is the white section, how big is the brown section. And I'm going to fill this area in just with some tones, some lines going this direction. And then maybe I want that to be a little bit darker. So if I've got lines going this way and I want to cross hatch over those. So cross hatching is a way of kind of filling things in. What you want to avoid in cross hatching is things crossing at right angles. Um, and so I'm going to, I don't want, I don't want these to be a, you want ideally diamonds. Diamonds are a hatcher's best friend. Uh, diamonds are going to work much better in sort of hatching things than, 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 than the, the, the little grid. <laughs> what a lovely little bird. So I sort of suggested that little light area behind the eye, a little bit of the forehead. Um, then there's this light area here across the back. And then we're going into what um what technically is this little dark patch on the shoulder? What, um, what's going on with that? Okay. That's a, a very plovery thing. It's structurally, I'm curious about what this happening. So if I have Yes, I sometimes erase. Um, I want to have this sort of white collar coming down, looking my little white face. Now let's think about this 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 wing and what we're seeing here a little bit. Um, I have. You can see a kind of up here on its back. A hold on, I'm gonna to try to bring in another screen here. All right, so here's here's this little lovely bird. 
And what I want to do is I want to analyze the back of this bird with you. And we're going to turn it into several different zones. And that is going to help us be able to draw it. So as I'm looking across the back, here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing this triangle up here. Below that, this is this is subtle, but 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 bear with me here. If you are wanting to be sort of a, an anal retentive bird drawer, this this next one, this is a little subtlety, but this is cool. If you notice right in here, there is you see a couple of big rows. Actually, it's going yeah, right, right here, this area here. we're seeing an, a separate little kind of zone of feathers. And I'll get rid of my color stuff here in just a moment. So we're going to be looking for that actually here. And then the final part of this wing is going to be this part. And this is made of rows coming like this. And just to add one other sort of final, final part, I have a few things sticking out here. A few things sticking out here. And finally, these little black sharp tips. All right. So what is going on here? What's going on here? The pink zone is the back of the bird, right? Sometimes we call this a mantle back there. The orange zone is what is called the scapular feathers. And those um, originate from a spot above the bird's shoulder blade. The purple zone, the yellow zone, and the green are part of the wing itself. And the, um, the purple zone, these are rows of what are called covert feathers. They're median and lesser covert feathers, or greater median and lesser covert feathers. The yellow zone, are parts of the secondary feathers and the tertials. And then the green are the primary feathers that are sticking out there. And so I'm going to make all these zones go away in just a moment. And what I want you to do is to look really carefully at the boundaries of these zones and see if you can pick out these different areas. I'm now going to draw on top of these with a sharper pen so that we can see a little bit more detail on this. Up here in the scapulars, there is this row of little feathers up here. And tucked under that, there's another row of feathers that are down below that. And then I have bigger feathers that are tucked underneath those. And then there are bigger feathers that are tucked underneath those. And um, I think if we get uh, in here and were to carefully be able to pick all these out, there I think there's often five little rows of those. But notice how those are overlapping, sort of starting small up here. And then they're getting bigger and floofier as they're going down here. But that makes a little cap there across the back. So on the, 
Um, on here, we've got these little kind of on the on the wing, we've got little rows of of, of crescents. Over here, oh, actually, we've got these are some also some bigger scapular feathers still sticking out in here. We've got those going all the way down like that. All right. So we've got this this pile of scapular feathers that are coming back this way in rows. Knowing that, let's go back to. So what I want to do is I just want to I want to make this this back give this back some structure that's going to make sense, and kind of remembering those things I've got this triangle up here. And then there is this big pad of scapular feathers that is going to come in here. I'm going to have my cobra feathers in my wing are going to be down in here. And then I'm going to have some personals and primary feathers sticking out of the back. All right. Now, if I do this on the back of the bird, it's going to look like a pine cone or a fish. I want to get a suggestion of this scale in this, but not overdo it. Also, as I'm putting in the suggestion of the scaliness, if we're kind of looking here towards the back of the bird, if I have scales that come right up to the edge like this, I'm missing that the ones that are right here at the edge are actually wrapped around the side of the bird and they're foreshortened away from them. So what I would expect to see is that those would be at more of a kind of a, 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 a an angle. I want to, to, to be able to wrap these ones here, make them smaller, thinner, because they're kind of going around the, the, the contour of the bird. So in here, I'm going to put in a suggestion of these feathers. But I have to be careful with getting two things that are sort of too much uh, the, the, that, that curve. I want to be careful when I get right up there to that edge, suggesting there's a little bit of fluffiness out there. Now I'm down here in the scapular feathers. And in here, there's a bunch of scoop, 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 scoop. And I want to be aware that these things generally are kind of coming here. And they're getting bigger as we go down. And but what I'm not going to do is kind of get lost in kind of creating each one. Otherwise, I get too much of a sort of scaly pattern in there. Down here in the wing, there are these rows that wrap around here. And notice that the ones that are at the bottom are crisper, cleaner, easier to see. So I might in here have a hint of these feathers coming in. And then as I get into the rest of the wing here, just suggesting That wing flies. So there's my back, my scapulars. I have my uh, secondary uh, covert feathers in here. And then sticking out the back here are maybe a bigger scapular, I'm not sure. 
These ones here are what are called tertial feathers with the light edge around them. Those sit up on top of the secondaries. And then your black tips out here are primary feathers. Now I'm just going to put in a little dark shape there for it and for this other one. Let's make the belly of this be fluffy. Notice that this edge here is fluffy. This is smooth because the feathers are all pointing in this direction. And some of the feathers, they have their back edges are fluffy. So down in here, I'm going to add a little bit of poop. And now the leg. So we can see this little joint here. That's actually the bird's ankle. That's not there, it's down here, look at that. I was about to draw it up here because that's where it was in my little preliminary sketch. It's really easy when you get these orange lines on here or little preliminary lines, you start following the lines that you have um, on, on there instead of, um, instead of paying attention to where things are easy to kind of start following your, your your guidelines. But really, this thing's ankle is down here, isn't it? So it has a leg that comes up. Right? This is part of the shin bone here that comes to its ankle. And the ankle is going to be kind of bigger and swollen. How far down the bands are going to start somewhere in here? The foot is largely hidden in the sand here. I'm going to just sort of suggest that there's something going on here, but there are kind of grains of sand in here, and they're blocking a lot of my view of the foot. Um, if you can't see the feet, don't draw the feet. If you can't see the feet, draw the feet. Now I'm just going to go back in here. Tighten up some of these lines. Sort of make the edges of this a little bit more crisp. Double check to see if I made the bill too long. My bird's, this bird is looking down a little bit. Mine's looking up a little bit. I like the posture a little bit better with it looking down, but I'm just going to accept that this one's not going to do that. If I want to add some tone in on the bill, I'll show you kind of a cool trick that I do. There is this, if you look at the bill in the photograph, you see that there is, zoom more, in the photograph, there is a highlight above and below the bill. So I'm just going to shade from the side here and I'm going to stop before it gets to the edge of the bill. And on the top, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm shading here and then I'm going to shade up towards this edge. And as I bring my pencil down, I stop before I get to that line. And then I get these very crisp little cool billy effects. Now it's taking a closer look at one sweet little bird. <laughs> Um, so now what I'd like to do is to return to our friends at Point Blue. And uh, we're going to be here to take your questions. Um, and I'm going to stop my screen share. Bye. Um, 
And um, I'd love to bring in um, Chris and Anne and uh, Lishka, if you would like as well. Um, going to add you to the spotlight. And uh, Lishka, would you like to join us on the screen or? Um, I've got to pop off actually, but I super enjoyed this. I left some love and links in the chat and I look forward to seeing you for penguins. Oh, thank you so much. And also <laughs> thank you for what you're doing to um, help Point Blue with its mission. It's my absolute pleasure. Thanks for being part of it. Bye. All right. Um, so we're going to take a look in the chat and we can ask questions out of the chat. What we can also do is it, it's more fun to ask questions live. Um, and if uh, the way you can do that is use the raise hand function and then whoop, we'll bring you into the, uh, the meeting and you can ask your question of these good people. Um, and uh, you, if you don't can't find that raise hand um, uh, button on there, um, just turn your screen on and, you know, either, you know, do some sort of a dance or just kind of go like this and we'll spot that you've got uh, a question there. Um, are there any questions that people have for, for Point Blue? Let's first join Chloe. Um, thank you so much for joining us here. And I hope that you enjoyed uh, meeting the scientists who study these birds. I did, and um, I just had a quick question. Do these birds really only live in like salt water kind of areas? Or can they live like next to lakes? Mm. That's a good question. Um, and there was a little bit of this in the chat. Um, so the Western Snowy Plover is actually found throughout the Intermountain West and on the Pacific coast. And so if you go to the Great Salt Lake, there are Western snowy plovers also breeding there and throughout the West in saline lakes. The federally listed population is the population that breeds on the Pacific coast. And somebody asked in the chat about um, whether, um, uh, what was the question in the chat? Uh, the Pacific coast populations, the listed population the interior population is not currently listed. Um, there's not actually genetic differences between the two populations. There have been some genetic studies done, but we know from the banding that we've done that our banded birds don't go to the interior to breed. Um, so we think that from a behavioral observational standpoint, they don't intermingle. So it's, it's a really good question because yes, they do breed in these, what we call saline lakes uh, environments um, in the interior West as well. Okay, so and I had one more question. What other things do they eat other than the bugs or do they mostly just eat those bugs? The, the amphipods are a pretty important prey. They also love kelp flies. So um, the little kelp flies that are associated with rack that are the kinds of things that if you go to the beach and you're in your bathing suit, they'll drive you crazy. Um, that, that's one of their favorite preys. And then they also like to eat um, beetles, which are associated with rack. And there's a, a bunch of different species of those. In fact, there are so many different species of this, the fauna that exists on the surface of the beach, that even the people who are really experts at identifying it can't always identify um, the things that are on the beach um, to the down to the species. Yeah, it's quite a diversity of, but those are the major categories. Good question. So uh, when and so when we're talking about also so, whether something is listed or not, what that means is that these species are there. There are some where the scientists have noticed that their population is really in trouble, and those are the ones that have um, that when we're kind of thinking about endangered species, or threatened and endangered species. I'm going to bring up for you, Chloe, a little a picture of um, the range of this bird and. Um, Maybe we can use that to help kind of interpret what we're seeing. Yeah, that's a great illustration. And you can see the cluster um, in there around the Great Salt Lake. There's also... Um, so the, the, so the, the Great yeah. Salt Lake being... Can you see my arrow? Yes. On my screen? So that's in here, okay? Yep. Yeah, and and 
So yeah, they're, they are distributed across the Western United States, as you can see there, and into Mexico as well. But yeah, I think it's a good point that Jack brings up when we talk about the listed population, we've identified this Pacific Coast population as having experienced significant declines from historic levels. So let me give you guys some examples of that. So right now, there are fewer than 2,500 birds in this Pacific Coast population. And if you think about it, sometimes you could go to a, you could go to a beach and see 2,500 gulls just standing in one place on a beach. That's how few snowy plovers there are distributed all the way from southern Washington down to the Mexican border breeding. So not very many. Um, the target for the recovery for the population is around 3,000 birds, and we just haven't been able to successfully reach that yet. Um, when we look at historic use of beaches in the state of California, snowy plovers are absent from more than 50% of the beaches that they were breeding on back in the 1950s to 1970s. Mm -hmm. And if you think about what's happened in California in the last 50 to 70 years, we've had just a huge amount of coastal development, mostly in Southern California. And those, you know, those areas were probably really the stronghold of the snowy plover. Um, so when you go south of um, say Santa Barbara, most of the areas that you find snowy plovers breeding are on military bases. Um, so Point Magoo, Naval Weapons Station, Camp Pendleton, these are the strongholds of the snowy plover in the Southern California area. And, and that's true for a lot of, of listed coastal strand species. Um, military bases are have, are have and are continuing to kind of function as large um, ecological reserves, even though there's lots of things there that are impactful too. They're very large and in, intact breeding areas for plovers. Chloe, those were really good questions, and we appreciate you um, uh, bringing that up. Thank you. It's really good to see you. Chloe, did you did you sketch along with us? Do you have anything you want to share? Um, I did a little bit. Um, I'm a pretty slow sketcher, so um, I couldn't sketch too well on the slide. Um, oops. Hang on. Oh, you Ooh. caught its cuteness. Yep. You've That's got great. really good proportions across the back. So the head to body size, you've got that. And then those angles across the back and the head. Um, well, very, very good observations of the shape and the structure of that. And some good I drew some over here, space. but I drew some more over here, but you can't really see them because they're pretty faint. Okay. Yeah, I would definitely know that's a juvenile if I looked at it. <laughs> Good That's job. what we want. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, thank you, Chloe. Great to see you. Um, let's uh, uh, bring in Frank into the conversation. Thank you for being with us. If you turn on your screen, we'll be able to add you to this screen. Um, oh, there you are. Hey, guys. Add you into the spotlight. Thanks for taking my um, question. I was just wondering, um, does the salt and the air affect the colors of the feathers is, is one question I had. And then the other one was, I always have trouble in the belly when I'm drawing a bird. Like there's always a line between the color of the bird and the background. I always have trouble kind of just making that look real. Well, what I'll do is I'll let Chris field your first question, then I'll field the sec the second question. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you being there. Yeah, hey, Frank. Thank you for being with us. I, I I think it's a good question, and I I think it goes back to the selective pressure that's been exerted on plovers as they've evolved, and so they have had to match their environment. And so, uh, if you go to you know, say Point Reyes, where you've got maybe a little bit darker sand um, than we might have, say down at, um, you know, down in San Diego. I'm, that's just hypothetical. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. Um, you might see some differences in the egg colors that are being produced, um, like slight variation. Um, and, you know, it's probably the same with the adults and chicks. There is a, there is a Florida snowy plover, which is actually related to, it's a, it's, it's a different, it's not Let's just say that is genetically distinct um, and it's a different, it's actually a different subspecies. 
And if you go to Florida, um, you'll really understand what what people say when they say snowy plover, because it is the snowiest plover I've ever seen. Oh. Um, so they are much lighter there because it's white sand beaches there. They're really, really white. Um, and so it would make sense that in salt flat areas, they might be a little bit lighter um, because that's what's going to be selected for over the long term for those like those interior um, saline lake populations like the um, Great Salt Lake. I've never had the you know opportunity to see snowy plovers at the Great Salt Lake, but I wouldn't be surprised if they were a little bit lighter. It's a good question. Nice. Um, and let me try to uh, field the question on the, the, the belly shape. I'm going to change over to this view. And um, so there, there, there are several things that I that I notice. Um, let's see if I can go down closer. All right. Um, there, there's a few things that um, that that I'll do. So sometimes I'll make this and it will stick out too far. And when I do that, what I will often do then is I'll come in and I'll just sort of recarve or then recarve. And uh, so let's say I, I feel like this, I want this to be not as chesty. Um, on this same drawing, if I could get in there and erase things, but what I will find I often do is I'll just often kind of get in there and just re-trim that down. It's harder to go the other way. It is, it's, and I'm just gonna make this a little bit of a stronger line. And then sometimes you can even just add a little bit of tone back there. And then those, all those other lines kind of disappear into the void. But if you start with it too, too thin, and then you want to add another line on the outside of it, these lines will show up very well. These inserts, inner ones show up very well. So it's easier to have your bird a little bit too much of a chest and then to carve it down, then to go the other way. Um, things you can do is you can add some tone into the background. Um, let me actually reduce this and sort of show you a few little kind of fun tricks. Like let's say there is some, uh, some uh, beach vegetation out, out here. Um, sometimes I, I can sketch in a few little kind of Know, pieces of debris on the beach here. And then as I'm coming in here and I hit those, I'll just kind of work around them. And that can sort of put things into your background. But having some tone back there pops that out, especially if this is a pale chest. Uh, a little bit of tone back there does a really nice job of pulling that forward. Uh, did that answer your question? Well, hold on, I'll, I'll let you, uh, you can unmute again. Uh -huh. There we go. Um, yes, it did very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Both, both answers. Uh, Frank, thank you so much for being here with us today. My pleasure. I'm happy. Um, I'd like to bring in the mad botanist um, into the conversation. Um, and Avea, hi there. Hi there. This was so much fun. Thank you so much um, for just telling us so much more about them and making us fall in love with them even more and for drawing them. And my question was, we were having a really good conversation in the chat about Ocean Beach and King Tides and whatnot. Um, and so we were talking about how nests might be lost. Um, and so um, I had a, some data from a few years ago. Um, that I took at Ocean Beach, where I was measuring the low tide of the king tide versus the high tide. And so um, this would be from the low tide, from the edge of the dunes here are to about 510 feet. Um, and I noticed that the sea rack, um, the beach rack appears right here at about um, just a little bit less than 144. Um, and then a few days later, um, that would have been the, I think like the 11th, and then this would have been the, yeah, the 14th. Um, then it lessened quite a bit during the high tide, so that instead of it going out to 510 feet, it only goes to 100, and the beach rack is moved to a bit more than 40. Um, in that case, in a situation like with the king tides, would the beach rack being moved help at all, or is it, um, or like, 
would they be more going towards the dunes or I guess I'm wondering how would they survive or deal with such a huge change like that during the winter or is, is that not even nesting season? Um, I have questions. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And Ivea, we should sign you up for our um, California Marine Protected Area Sandy Beach Monitoring Module because those those um, metrics are exactly the things that we measure um, in the field. Um, we look at the the high tide strand line, which so so ecologically these zones are all really important, but they're mostly important for the invertebrates. Um, because, you know, those tiny invertebrates are dependent on the rack. And so the plovers are, you know, and other shorebirds that feed on this sort of surface dwelling stuff are, are pretty able to move, right? They're good. They're good. They're highly mobile. They can move around a lot and with, you know, changes um, just in a normal tidal cycle. And, you know, they're obviously geniuses at the tidal cycle, right? They understand the tidal cycle in ways that we can't even comprehend. Um, but I do think it could, it could potentially matter for the invertebrates and if there are you know sudden changes where things are unpredictable you could have a lot of mortality um, and the other thing that we talk about and that of course affects everything else the other thing we talk about with that you know that rack kind of system and how vulnerable it is is that um if we have really cold temperatures in the winter that can also really affect you know whether those invertebrates are able to even move <laughs> So they could get they could get stranded um, and 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 sort of like it's a little bit of a digression, but I think an interesting thing since you're interested in this is that one of the things that can be done to enhance habitats is to actually bring rack in. Um, so it's the opposite of removing it from beaches and and so some people have done this and you know management manipulations um, and then it still takes a little while for the invertebrate you know sort of creatures to follow suit so it's better for it to just be there the whole time and have those populations be sort of cycling in that in situ um, but it is something that people have done in some places to try to kind of seed in new invertebrate populations in places that have been heavily impacted but yeah ecologically all those zones are really important and and Ocean Beach doesn't have nesting plovers um neither does Chrissy Field but um the way that you get nesting plovers at places that don't have them is to have a wintering flock. And both, both of those places have them. So you're exposing birds potentially in the breeding population to breeding sites. Then you still have to have a, a, you know, a nice calm sort of protected place for them to breed. And this happened down at Colo Point Reserve and down in Santa Barbara, where they had a wintering flock for a long time. And then they protected some beach with just a cable strand, still had lateral access. Um, and then they started really kind of doing outreach to folks who visited that beach. It's a relatively small system. And within about a year or so of doing that, they had breeding snowy plovers. Um, and now they've got, you know, nice. yeah, they've got 250 plovers wintering there and, you know, 50 plus nests a year at that site. So when we look at places like Ocean Beach and Chrissy Field and other suitable habitat that we go, oh, this looks like there could be snowy plovers breeding here. Why are there not? It's usually because they don't have a place that's sequestered enough for them to breed. And then of course, at Ocean Beach, we have huge amounts of European dune grass, which is um, sort of like the, you know, you know, your plant person. So I don't need to tell you, but it's 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 also not that really that suitable for nesting for plovers. So it would be nice to have a have some sort of restoration there that um, brought back native plants. Absolutely. And that gives me even more questions. Like, um, so at Chrissy Field, I, I have to check on the state of it because the dunes for a while have been kind of roped off, but those it's interesting. The dunes are the 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 posts that hold those are now sunk mm -hmm. down to maybe knee level or or lower, um, and I'm guessing that that might be shifting sands or mm -hmm. maybe I don't know. Um, but the beach itself, none, no part of the beach is is roped off. Would that be what would be sort of needed? Is to have part of the beach itself? I'm yeah, not, the not four dune. Thing. Yeah, it not it's a fine line, right? Because plovers need to nest above the high tide strand line, other nests will be flooded. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't, they're not up in the high vegetation, right? Because they need to maintain their ability to detect the approach of predators. They need to be able to sort of scan the environment for predators. Um, so yeah, no, it's a really, it is an interesting thing. And you're, you're right about the dune building. And this is the amazing thing about dunes. We have so many places in Monterey Bay where this has happened, where there's sort of a small section of beach that's been protected, um, and it's been restored to native plants and there's a cable fence and it's a very wide beach. So there's lots of area outside of it. And what ends up happening from kind of a, a, a aeolian or windblown transport is that that dune, when it builds up, then affects the stuff that's in front of it, even though it's not protected. And then little dunes start to build up there. And then those little dunes beget other little incipient dunes. And so it's a really, it's a really neat to witness that you don't actually have to protect everything to restore 
you know, this is such a big topic right now with sea level rise and climate change. And so we want to increase the physical resiliency of these systems. And that's one of the ways to do it. So it's really neat to see how those systems evolve. That Chrissy Field project is, has been there for a while now. And it's probably just, it's building. There's a sand source there and it's building up over time. That's been the interesting thing is that comparing a Silomar, which I'm told got restored, like I want to say 70, yeah. you know, it, it got long restored time super ago. long time ago. <laughs> and then Chrissy Field, meanwhile, the restoration began, I want to say 97, really in earnest in like 99. And then in 2000, they let the water in. And then 2001, it was declared open to the, and there's still ongoing maintenance, but that's 20 years difference there. And yeah. you can see just how well developed a Silomar are versus there's some other, I don't remember exactly where it is, but somewhere up north, um, there's this inland wetland that they were doing some work on a few years back. Marley took us on a field trip. I can't remember, but it's new. And so it's interesting seeing how that changes over time, which ones, like how the development, like looking at a Silomar and knowing that Chrissy Field could be somewhat like that someday is exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. And I think like kind of circling back to that community engagement piece for people, you know, if you want to do something more than just bring your stewardship mentality, you know, you can go to your local jurisdictions, right? And really push for these kinds of things. Like if you live in San Francisco, why do, why are our beaches covered with Ammophila? Why, why do we not? <laughs> we as the citizens of San Francisco would like to have native vegetation on our beaches. We know it's better at attenuating wave energy. We know it's better for biodiversity. It's aesthetically more pleasing, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's more practical kind of policy influence things that that people can lobby for. And sometimes it's, it, it is really individuals lobbying for those things that causes change. So I encourage everybody to do that on things that, you know, are related to this coastal strand thing and sort of restoring, you know, some level of like function and diversity there is there's so many places left to, to do that. There's a lot of places that have had a lot of good work, but there's, you know, plenty that are left <laughs> to work on. I'll say one quick thing and then I'll pass the mic. I did, um, I, I don't remember the name, but I did actually find that they had some sort of a plan for Ocean Beach and a ton of stuff that they're going to be trying to do. And I think that it involved one of the transportation districts and something else, but like there's, there is a really massive document out there for how they want to change it. Yeah. Um, but, but, um, but it seems to have been like stalled and it's yeah. not, they're not really making a lot of headway. So so maybe that's what you were saying about about talking to your local legislators, maybe like pushing on that and saying, hey, we've got this. Why is it being held up? Maybe yep. that can help. Yep, absolutely. And there's a ton of money in the funding environment right now for this type of restoration. So um, California, you know, the natural resources, the 30 by 30 initiative that probably a lot of people have heard about. Um, the big thing that we're trying to do is to, you know, is to restore biodiversity on a lot of a lot of these lands. So there's 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 plenty of, of funding out there to support these projects, which is a, is funny to say. <laughs> when is there ever plenty of funding for anything? Yeah. <laughs> um, Vea, before you go, um, those journal pages that you shared just sort of show really kind of interesting thinking about recording different artifacts of, of natural phenomena. You made maps, and you're you're putting in the locations of beach rack, and um, and who knew that later on there'd be this whole conversation where the distribution, the location of beach rack, is going to be important. That's one reason why kind of we take these kinds of notes. We don't know when you know, at some point down the line this is going to be really relevant. But then you're comparing the location of the beach rack at different times. I think that that's a really good example of kind of the value of taking field notes. And then Chris mentioned some class that's about becoming a monitor for the kids. So just say a little bit more about that because that made my, I think our ears wiggle. Uh, but you're muted. Oh, Chris. You're muted. And we really want to hear this. Sorry, I, I just noticed. Um, so there's a there is a, a statewide scientific effort that Point Blue is one of multiple teams on monitoring the condition of sandy beaches on marine protected area beaches in California. And what Ivea showed was like a, a sort of this lot, what we call cross shore transect, where we do actually go out and measure um, these um, key features on the beach, and then we look at them in relation to rack. We do bird, we do longshore bird surveys. Um, along the beaches. And so this is something that's sort of part of the um, the marine protected area decadal assessment project that's been going on um, for the past couple of years since the Marine Life Protected Protection Act, which is I think 2011. Um, and so there is also an opportunity um, from the standpoint of MPA collaboratives, if you are all have 
are familiar with and have heard of those. So that is a way to engage um, with what's going on in your MPA areas and your region. Um, but I, I specifically called out Ivea because if you ever want to come help us out on our surveys, like if you're interested, just reach out to me. Um, it's uh, it's we can always use an extra hand. It's a great learning opportunity. It's pretty rigorous, intense work, but it's also fun, and you learn a lot about what kind of kelp is on a given beach, and you learn where all these key ecological features are along the beach, and that those are long-term data sets that are going to be monitored on MPA beaches and reference beaches for. Um, we have about five years of data now. We're going to collect about four more. Can I just say, Ivea has never shied away from rigorous, intense work. <laughs> yeah. Avea can do rigorous. <laughs> I will. I would love to join you. You've you've got my heart. <laughs> All of this. Thank you. Yes. Join. Yes. You. Yeah. Just reach out to me on on any front. You can reach out to me on the plover front as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. And so we'll be racking our brains to uh, figure out what we can do to. Uh, to extend those sort of habitat conditions and getting that data will help with that. Um, there's, I see there's a question from Joyce um, in the in the chat. Um, Joyce, do you want, oh, actually, first I'm gonna bring uh, Avea back in. I'm so sorry. It's, it's, it's because I suddenly realized um, there's one more thing going on. I'm um, speaking of, of like horribly awesome puns. This weekend, sure could use your help because it's the it's the California coastal cleanup. So Point Blue mentioned a place that they're going to be going, but that's all up and down all of the beaches in California and even some areas beyond. So sure could use your help this weekend. Look for your local um, California Coastal Commission cleanup sites um, and let's make these beaches beautiful. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Excellent. And the... Um... So let's, uh, we're going to bring Joyce in and then we'll be closing for the day. Um, uh, Joyce, did you want to ask your question live or should we read it out? Um, yes. So, uh, hold on. We're, you can now unmute and I'm going to bring you. Awesome. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, hey so I live in Houston, so I know this is very um, West Coast centric, but we have them here and I I was confused. I looked at the map and yes, and, and you showed the map and yes, they're here. <laughs> so I was like, am I just confused? Um, but no, 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 they're, they're here. And so, um, and meanwhile, you know, we drive on our beaches. Um, and so, the, you know, I'm kind of thinking about this a little bit too. Um, but I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering if these are the same subspecies as the ones on the West Coast but ours are a different population. But how did how did how does that happen exactly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're, you're it's correct. kind of far you're away. Correct. There's mountains yeah. and all that stuff in the way. So. Yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's an interesting question, and and like you know, genetics and kind of evolutionarily significant units or distinct population segments is not my area of scientific expertise. But the Pacific Coast population is listed as a distinct population segment, again, without any sort of really rigorous genetic underpinning. But these are these populations are all monitored and they're, they're they, um, they operate in distinct ways. And so what that means is, for example, and I can't, I'm not an expert on the Texas or the interior populations, but one of the things I know, for example, is like the Great Salt Lake population largely winters on you know, the, the East coast of Mexico and the, and in the Gulf area, for example, they don't decide that they're going to come all the way to the Pacific coast. So there's, there's ways in which mechanisms in which populations became either isolated over time or dispersed into appropriate habitats, you know, from sort of source populations, um, because of the way I'll just put this caveat into the genetics. And again, it's not my area of expertise, but probably people here who know a lot more about genetics than I do, um, because of the way, um, that, the DNA tests have been done in the genetics so far. It's the um, it's the uh, mitochondrial DNA, which is associated with females. And um, females in bird populations tend to disperse a lot more from their natal sites than males do. That's just a, a thing in bird ecology. And so because there aren't differences detected there among the Shiradrius nevosus, nevosus, and you're 100% correct, that's the subspecies 
of nevosis, which is the Western snowy plover. So for example, like the, the, the Florida snowy plover is much more closely related to the Cuban snowy plover, which is um, tenuo, ro tenuo rostris. And if you, if you guys look at the Birds of North America accounts, you can see some of the genetic stuff, but the, there's been really recent genetic work sort of showing um, that like the Caribbean populations are, you know, genetically sort of distinct um, from the Western populations and, um, and I can't like lay it all out for you because it honestly, it's changed a lot in the last five years. Um, but yeah, the way birds are unusual because they can disperse long distances. So you'd think that they would, why don't the Utah plovers come to the Pacific coast? It's just too far, I guess. So, um, and so when we talk about the interior Western Great Basin population, technically the Utah population, I guess would be considered part of that. But when I think of them, I'm talking about the Sal Salton Sea, Owens Lake, things that are in California. And those birds that do breed at those saline lakes are not part of the Pacific Coast breeding population. And, and we have yet to detect banded plovers breeding in any of that were banded on the Pacific Coast ever breeding in any of these interior, you know, very Western Great Basin areas. Um, so we just know there's not a lot of reproductive exchange going on. Every now and then there's this sort of wackadoo something or other that'll show up, but it's very, very, very rare. Um, and then of course, the coastlines of Mexico are incredibly remote and not really that well monitored. They're much better monitored now than they were 20 years ago. So there's a lot going on, particularly like in Northern Baja. Um, and there's more going on in mainland Mexico coast than, than there used to be. So I think we'll just learn more and more over time. But yeah, it, it is confusing. And it's um, the sort of, it used to be Shiradrius alexandrinus nevosis. And that sort of was like a global you know, globally distributed species and we were nevosis was the subspecies and then it was the Pacific Coast population of the, anyway, that's all changed. <laughs> so I, I hope I'm illuminating and not not confusing, but it I, I think there's probably more to learn and as techniques get more sophisticated, we'll learn a little bit more. Um, and, and, and that, hold on a second, we're going to allow you to unmute. Uh, did, did that address your question? Oh yeah, it, it did. It did. And it is just, it is, it's beautiful how birds are very much in, in motion. You know, we have um, some flamingos close by right now that, you know, that have just kind of blown over as a result of a storm. Um, and so that happens. Right. But then also it, I, it seems that the ones that we have, the snowy plovers um, tend to live here, right. They, they, so somehow they, 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 they stayed here. And so, yeah, it's just beautiful to think about um, how things are kind of constantly changing and we can't really, um, even because of, of um, land change use, just even how things can change on a decade level. Um, and then and then you're right, just looking at the genetics and kind of trying to piece all that apart is is fascinating because that gives us a, such a story. So, yeah, yeah thank you. And, and, and your, your question also ties into this sort of fascinating question in in biology of you know what's a species and when you kind of look under the hood just a little bit you realize it's a mess um <laughs> and that um you know when, when I was first learning about this sort of stuff I thought like oh a species is if these things can interbreed then they're they're a species and that was kind of cut and dried for me. But what happens when you have two sort of groups of things, say, um, you know, there's, you know, uh, nut hatches that uh, populations of nuthatch, where you can, they look just alike, they sound just alike, but they're hanging out on other sides of the country. And they never kind of get together. So you can't see if they interbreed. Do you call these different species or not? Or is this a population of the same species? Um, or what about things where like nobody's out there watching them, like insects, like nobody's out there saying like, let's see if this bug can get away. We're basically kind of looking like this one looks more blue than this. Let's call this a different species because there's some morphological characteristic. And then you've got other things where there are morphological characteristics like uh, red shafted flickers and yellow shafted flickers. They both, they've got yellow and red. That's really, really different. They, and then they get together and they're going like, hey, you look like a flicker. Let's make this work. And, you know, the, so sometimes morphological characteristics that we're seeing, like to the birds, that's not significant. There's, and there's also, you know, th then there's, what do you get when you look at the genes of it? Um, or when we're looking back in time, you're like, what do you call a species of dinosaur when there's nobody out there kind of seeing like, can that one successfully mate with that one? And 
you know, so it the the whole area is is elegantly complex and um and fun. Um and uh I can you can unmute if you want to. Um wait, hold on, you are you are muted. Okay, no, that that that's it. That that's it exactly. Um yeah, it's um it is fascinating. And it is fascinating to see too also just how, like you said, we can have places that are very far apart have so many similarities in the communities and the kinds of critters that are in those communities. Um, and uh, yeah, and and so coming from down here, it's just fun to see what's going on over there. <laughs> yeah. you know? and, and then part of the problem is that it then gets political because if you've got an endangered species status, then there's resources to help protect your habitat. Right. But where do you draw the line around that? Um, I generally say that we what we want to do is err on the side of preserving biodiversity. And uh, um, so um, I just want to take, before we close, I'd like to take this opportunity again to give my thanks to the team from Point Blue Conservation Science for coming out and sharing with us some amazing things about these incredible birds. There are lots of ways to get involved with Point Blue as a volunteer or also as a financial supporter. A fun way to do that right now is their Birdathon. Um, let's put the link to the Birdathon in, into the, 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 the chat. So you can either sponsor a team. Like the, I like that, like we ought to kind of get behind like the, uh, uh, the, the, the fledglings sound like a lot of fun and the tanagers. Um, and again, these resources then go to support, um, these, uh, resources go to support, um, understanding these species in a way that helps us be able to make better decisions. We human beings have incredible influence on what happens in this on this planet. And how are we going to act to um, so that when Chloe grows up, she's not looking around and saying, what did you folks do with my planet, right? Um, what did you do with all my species? Um, yeah, that's a big responsibility and data and evidence is really important and helpful to be able to do that. And that's what we get from Point Blue Conservation Science, um, critically gives us the, you know, sometimes the best we have to deal with, to, to, to use is anecdote and that's hard. Um, the more solid evidence that we can get from the, from this kind of research, the better decisions we'll be able to make. Um, so Chris and Anne, thank you so much for being here. I'd also like to bring the mad botanist back in, if I could. Um, Avea, thank you so much for being here and supporting this community and this work. Um, we really appreciate uh, everything you're doing. Uh, yes. I was going to say thank you for bringing us all together. Thank you for giving us the chance to meet and learn from Point Blue Conservation Science and teaching us to fall more in love with the with the adorables by drawing them. And also, um, Point Blue, thank you for all the work you're doing over there. Oh. Had to. <laughs> wow, that's, this is, I see how it's going to be. And the last word goes to Avea Moore. Thank you so much. This is great. Oh, hey, Ray Bonto. Um, well, that was an accident. Um, well, but it's good to see you. Oh, I'm sorry you. we didn't get a chance to do a journal share this time. And um, oh, next time we meet, we'll, I think you should have a little bit more time to do that. Um, are you doing well? Yeah. How I hope you, you enjoyed this chance to kind of hang out with some of these biologists. Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you all. And everybody, until next time, take Bye, care. Everyone. Thank <laughs> you.